Hello, my friend. I'm glad to see you made it. Glory be to God. Jesus Christ is alive. And welcome to the Gospel Hour with David. Today we're going to be going over chapter 38 of the book of Genesis. We're going to talk about Judah and Tamar. And have a supporting verse. I'm not going to completely read all this for you. It's kind of a, a long read and it's a story. But I'll tell you what the story and that. And I have one verse from the New Testament which supports what's going on and happening there. And that is chapter 8 of the book of John. Uh, verses 1 through 53. Oh no. Verses 1 through 11. There's a woman caught in the act of adultery. But anyway, we'll get to that. Now, I want to talk about Tamar and Judah. I want to talk about, you know, we, we, we in life, we want to talk about everything and anything, right? We want to talk about the weather. Yeah. I want to talk about politics. I want to talk about the scripture. I want to talk about how your day was. I want to talk about, I want, we'll talk about anything as human beings, but there's one thing we struggle to talk about. And that's what I want to talk about today. Our, not theirs, our integrity. That's what I want to talk about. Our integrity. That's what this story is about, integrity. Standing up for what you believe. Integrity is the action behind what you confess to believe, or, or a set of rules, or beliefs, or whatever. The, the integrity is the action behind saying, I'm a good person, and then the action is producing good works. That, that's integrity. Saying, I'm honest, and, and then never lying. That's integrity. It's the action behind what you believe. Now, in this story, we're going to be talking about Forgiveness, of course, because without forgiveness, there's no love. Without love, you know, we're, we're absent of God. Now, some people, and, and, and how I see this story is a death of a relationship, a death of a son, and Judah loses two sons. We go back to chapters 37, we, we, we see there, there's uh, a lie is told, uh, they bear false witness about their younger brother Joseph, and they lie to their father, and their father believes that lie, and he believes that he's lost a son, his son is dead. There's a lot of people in the Christian world. Who believe that suicide is all out rejection of God, salvation. Suicide is the worst sin you can do. And there's no forgiveness for those people who commit suicide. And I want to tell you my little story before we get into this. Because I don't believe we can draw something out of the Bible without an experience. And in that, we find all these little stories about other people's experience of what happened in their life and the experience they had with God. And not just God, but the experience they had with sin. Judah is one part of his brother's scheme to get rid of their brother. What well, their experiences. So, so i got to tell you a little about my experience and how I know that God is with me. I used to, well, let me start further back. When I was 18, my best friend killed himself, committed suicide. I know suicide firsthand. My best friend at 18 years old, a few weeks after graduation from high school, got, got, got the world in front of him. A lot of hope, good kid, one of the star athletes of, of school, very popular kid, commits suicide. And I tell you, his mom and dad are, are good Christians. I've seen them and met them at church. 
years later, and not only are they believers and good Christians, they're some of the most hospitable people you'd meet. Good people. And we're going to tell them Christians, no, nah, your, your son is rotting in the fires of hell. So when I think of cursing, I, I, I use the F word or the F bomb. Lots of times it's a part of my language. And people say, oh, how dare you use the F bomb? You're cursing people and you're cursing yourself by using this foul language. Now, what about the, just the thought or the belief that somebody's rotting in hell? That to me is the greatest curse a human being or anything in being could receive. That the a, a, a fire of hell were an unquenchable fire, no escape forever and ever. That's a curse. Not the F bomb. But anyway. I've been walking with God my whole life. My whole life. And, and who is to say that that guy, or my friend, accepted Jesus into his life? Wasn't baptized. Wasn't baptized. Never claimed or, or said or confessed that Jesus was his Savior. Later in life, not too long ago, in 2013, I was working at a food bank. I was working at a food bank at the local church. And I was the doorman. I mean, if there's one place you want to be on earth, that's inside the house of God. Even if you were the doorman, that, that's a good place. And I thought that. I believed that. And as a doorman at the food bank at the church, you know, they'd have to go downstairs into the basement where the cafeteria was and there's all these elderly and widows and old ladies and different people who are crippled and disabled, no longer able to work for themselves, most of them, don't have the mental capacity or the physical capacity. And so you help them, and they get their, their pile or basket full of groceries, and you, I was the guy, grabbed their groceries, carried them up the stairs, out to their car, helped them out. Right? And I'd pray for them. Now I'm at the food bank. And, and, and I'd seen this woman there, and she had this shirt on, and on her shirt said, in loving memory of, of this person, and they had the picture of this person on their shirt. I seen that lady, and I could see right into her eyes, deep sorrow. Now, and I have a long, full beard, and I thought, yeah, I shaved. I couldn't shave my whole beard, because I'm working for God. <laughs> so I have a full beard, I have long hair. And to what people say today, or what they know Jesus to look like, they say, oh, I, I looked like, I looked just like Jesus. Long hair and long beard. <clears throat> now, I, I, in person, I'm very shy and humble and timid. and I don't make a big stink. I don't talk a lot. But I do tell people I'll pray for you. And when I say I'm going to pray for you, that means I'm going to pray for you. And this woman, see her, and a couple weeks later, come walking out of the restroom in my own house. I, on my house, I have scriptures and, and uh, graffiti, the scriptures and word of God and encouraging words written all over my house because I live at the entrance of the local high school and middle school in our town. I want to spread the word. And I have a little sign there and every once in a while, a few days, we change that sign as the bus drivers and all the children drive by that sign every day. And on that day, day or that time when Back in 2013, I had on the sign, Jesus Christ is coming, and he's coming soon. That's it. People see that. Yeah. <laughs> Creates thinking. He hasn't, we haven't seen him in 2,000 years. Hey. So I come out of the restroom in my, uh, in my own house, 
And, and there's that woman who I seen at the food bank standing in the middle of my living room, looking around, going, what the heck did I just do? And, and this, and I come walking around the corner and I come out and there's a, a woman standing in my living room and and the first thing she says is, wow, I, I feel completely embarrassed. I don't know what happened or came over me. I just walked right into your house. I didn't even knock. And in fact, I, I thought this was a church, but now I see. This is somebody's home. Do you own this place? Right? And to her bewilderment, she sees that it's me. I never spoke to her at the food bank. Only saw her. Made eye contact. And she sees, wow, it's you. It's you. And I say, well, what's brought you here? And she says to me, God. God told me to come into this house. And now I'm here, and I don't know why I'm here. Oh. Well, it's good to see you. It's good to meet you. And if God told you to come and come in here, then you're welcome. You're welcome to be here. What's going on? And at that, that very day, she's wearing that same shirt she had on at the food bank. And it says, in loving memory of this person. And it turns out that that person was her son who had committed suicide at 16 years old. And she tells me, three months ago, my son killed himself. And I don't know if he was saved. He never confessed Jesus was his Lord. And, and in fact, I don't remember him being baptized. Hmm. Yeah. It's tough. Everything you love, Jesus loves. Does forgiveness come into the mouth or, or does forgiveness come into our heart and, and maybe maybe it is that Jesus comes into our heart and then it is from our heart the truth flows out and comes out of our mouth I need to know if my son's okay when is Jesus coming I saw your son I said I don't know it's up to you when you're going to let him in. If you love your child, and if you're praying for your child's well-being, and whether they committed suicide or not, it's a deep sorrow, it's a deep tragedy. When people you love lose hope to the point they kill themselves. And I guess in a, in a way that could be the ultimate, the ultimate pain, suffering. That is, if someone could believe that God doesn't love them to the point that they're willing to, to end their lives. That's a deep sorrow, that's a deep pain that that person is carrying. And then once they're gone, their family is entrenched in deep, deep bitterness and sorrow. And, and I, I want you to know that all those boys, those boys are there in heaven. Those God's children. Those are God's children. And none of us are, are, are without hope. God's just waiting for you and, and mom and, and dad. There's, there's a dad I met 
I had a friend from way back in high school, and, and her father died, and I go to their funeral, and I got all the families gathered there, and, and her brother, who was my friend 20-some years ago, was there. And his son died in the Afghanistan war. And that father encouraged that son to go into the army. In, in the army, you're going to find character. In the army, you're going to find integrity. In, in the army, they're, they're going to get you set up on, on a good foundation to turn out to be an upstanding man. Dad pressures boy to go to the army. And then dies in the army. And met that funeral. And really, the only person I talked to was... That dad. His own father had died. They were sad. And his son had died about eight years prior. And with a great apple in his throat and a lump in his throat, he says, you know, my son died in that war. Yeah, I know. I heard. It was all over the news in her home state. I know. And he was very upset over his son not being there. The whole family and all of his nieces and nephews, and this was a large family. Twenty-some people, thirty people. Large family. Yet his beloved son was gone. And he had deep sorrow for that and regret. Unbeliever. And I tell him, well, let me tell you, there's no greater gift on earth that there's there's no love higher than there's no expression of love higher than a person who lays down his life for his family and his friends and, and I say look at what your son did you are all gathered here together and, and I tell the dad I said look man and he knew that I was a preacher and a pastor, and of course we're talking. And I know this for sure. That, that God most certainly is not going to take away your reward. No greater act of love than one lays down his life for his friends. He's not going to lose his reward. You're not going to lose your reward. Your son stands next to God today. And that you can bank on. That you can believe in. Like the mom. I need to know if my son is okay. And when you're going to release him from prison. See, see, when we, we have forgiveness, it's not you come to me and, and, and I know you forgave me when you are my friend. That, that's not how forgiveness works. Surrendering to the Lord, it's, when, when we surrender to Jesus Christ, it's everything. Everything is surrendered to Jesus Christ. My love, my hopes, my dreams, their well-being, everything must be surrendered to Jesus. Believe that God loves him. If God in us is expressing that love for our lost child, isn't it? us in agreement with God that there's no way in creation something I love is going to be tortured in an eternal fire. 
And when are we going to believe that? Right. Tamar represents what we know as today the bride of Christ. Not all Christians, but the bride of Christ. The Holy Spirit is a spirit of empowerment. Not, not intimidated, not being timid and weak, but empowerment. It was amazing when that woman came here. We, we talked for a while, and I encouraged her and reminded her of all the love, not only that God had for her, but that she had for her son was a representation, a reflection of the God whom she says she loved and believed in, living in her. We hugged and she went away, never to see again. Judah wasn't always a, an upstanding guy, as we know. Death, loss, and tragedy are, are, are some things that can hurt us. And one thing that I think hurts a, a man the most any man hurts them the most to the depths of their heart, to the sinew of their bones. It is when a woman in whom they have put all their trust and love into lies to them. Lies to them. And that creates deep anguish and pain. And in that they lose hope. So we need to be careful in what we're believing in. Do we believe in God? Do we believe in men? Do we believe in what we see? Do we believe in the integrity that that's alive in us? So Judah leaves his dad after giving them the bad news and through guilt and shame, I suppose he doesn't want to be in his dad's presence anymore because his dad refuses to be comforted. Now I'm going to go down to Sheol. I'm going to go down to the neither world. I'm going to go down to the grave with my son in mourning, in tears and deep bitterness. So Judah leaves, goes to town in Canaanite villages, finds a woman, Goes into her and has a son. Has two sons. And then has three sons. First son dies. He does wickedly in the eyes of the Lord. The Lord takes his life. What if that wickedness was losing hope? That son lost all hope. Killed himself. A lot of people think it's a wicked thing to do when you commit suicide. Right? So what's the Lord's answer? I took him. Because you couldn't find hope, love, mercy, grace, or purpose in, 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 in this world, in, in earth. I took him. Because I want him to know love, hope, grace, mercy. I want him to know me. Now the woman's left without a husband. And the second son, according to the law, we see in Deuteronomy and Numbers and that, that they have rules and laws to a way of holiness. The next of kin is to take that brother's wife and, and give her children. There's nothing worse than a woman without children. Especially in that day and age. Their value came from the children. Son don't want to include her into the inheritance. No, I had children with Tamar. Those children are going to be blessed with the inheritance. And that's less for my children. So I don't really love that woman. I only love my wife, my kids. And this is a favor for my brother. Right. Well, that son has, ends up dying. 
dying. And all the woman wanted was these men to hold up to the integrity by which they said they lived by. Follow your laws. Now the second son comes and he won't have sex with her. Spills, he, he has sex with her. He's okay with having sex. But every time he has sex, he spills his semen on the ground instead of giving her a child. So she puts on her widow clothes. And Judah says, I got one more son, but he's way too young. Right? This is not a young girl. This is a full-grown woman. He's way too young. But when he gets old enough, I will give him to you, and you'll have your seed. Well, he comes to age, and Judah doesn't give him the woman. Doesn't give the the kid to the woman, his son. The woman takes off her uh, widow clothes and, and puts on, you know, what we would see today as the burqa or, or like a Muslim woman, completely covered head to toe, and all there is is a little slit for her eyes. She don't want a, a loving relationship with Judah. She, she wants Judah to hold up to his integrity and, and include her into the kingdom, into the inheritance. Now, she covers herself. Can't see her. You don't know who she is. And says to her, I want to have sex with you, right? He, he believes she is a temple prostitute. Then she says, well, I'm not going to have sex with you for free. This costs something. What do you offer me? And he says, well, I'll bring you a couple of goats, a couple of kids, young goats, right? And the same in, in the Bible, you know, for our sins. God offers us a goat, and that goat will be killed and take the punishment of our sins instead of us, the sinner. But it's not good enough. Right? Can a goat stand up? Can, can the sacrificing of a goat prove God's integrity? That, that's the promise. I, I promise this is my vow to you. I give you this goat, and that's a, a, an example of, of my integrity. It's not good enough. No, I, I, I don't want the goat and the kid. And when you send that goat and that kid, you know, since it's not here, I need some kind of collateral. I want your integrity, she's saying, and I want your cord. In the, in the book of Numbers, right, we find that God says, make for yourselves these cords. This is my cord. This is the cord I make. And, and I wear these cords on my clothes everywhere I, I go. And it's to remind me that, that God chose me. I did not choose God. This, this is, reminds me God chose me. It's got one blue cord. One strand of blue in there. That top says Yod He Vav He. These these are represent numbers to letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Yod He Vav He, Yahweh. Right. And, and, and this represents salvation. I am salvation. The bottom half is Jesus. And this is the cord. Carry this with you. And make these for your garments and make coverings for yourself. So we have the cord, we have the covering, which is a, a prayer shawl, Jewish. This, this, is, this is what identifies the Jews from being different from the rest of the world. They, they have their, these aren't Jews so much, but the Israelites. They have their prayer shawl, their covering. Right? And on my prayer shawl has the, the, the cords as well. The blue. Yod-Heh-Vav-Heh. 
So she says, I want, I want the cord. I want your covering. I, I want your identity. I want your staff. And I, and I want your staff. These things that, that identify you. Th these are the things by which your integrity are, are hanging on. <clears throat> the Torah. Jesus says, I, right, I come to fulfill the Torah. Come to fulfill all this stuff. Judah has sex with the woman, and she conceives, is about to have a child, and she goes off and, and takes off her veil, no longer hidden, right? And, and that's the representation of the bride in Christ. Jesus gives us the veil, the covering, and, and in that, nobody can see our, our darkness. Nobody can see our anguish. Nobody can see our problems. Nobody can see the truth behind us. Nobody sees us. They, they see the covering. Jesus is the covering. I see Jesus. I see God. In that, when we wrap ourselves in, the, in that prayer cell, so remind us that, 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 that God has covered us in the shadow of his wings. So, so when Jesus says, go into your closet and, and, and pray in secret, He's saying to those people at that time, in a bit of slang language, go into your closet, go into a secret place, and make your prayer. Make your because it's the things done in secret that God sees. The having the prayer shawl, that that's a sign of obedience. I'm willing to trust you. In, in, in your instructions, the, the cord, the, that's a sign of obedience. You you didn't choose God. God chose you. And, and when God chose you, he chose to unveil himself to you. And, and that's what she wants, is integrity. Right? She, she's to be grafted in, and, and she's to be saved by the, the next of kin. The word kinsman, kin, is redeemed. Redeemer. To be my redeemer. If we have one mind, we're one body, in the body of Christ, Jesus Christ, my bride and the groom, say, come, redeemer. Same message. Message of love, hope, and comfort. And she goes off, takes those covering off, and there she is dressed in her widow clothes. And word comes to Judah. We've got to burn this woman alive, Judah. Your daughter-in-law became pregnant through immorality. It's called sexual immorality. She got pregnant during an act of sexual immorality. And as a child who's conceived in sexual immorality, in, in immorality, Judah says, bring her out and burn her alive. She's done wickedly. She did wrong. Keep in mind, we're kind of talking about suicide. And, and not just suicide, but the destruction of, of a friendship, a relationship, a marriage. Maybe friendship between... A mom who loves her son. Still he was his, her own flesh. Or a father who loves his son. Still he was his own flesh. A friend who loves his friend as though he was his own flesh. And before they can get her too far, she says, who's this stuff? I, I have this cord, and I have this covering, and I have this staff. And, and they're in the midst, there's, there's, there's a Hebrew man, right? Judah, father of Jews. Got this Hebrew man, 
in a Canaanite village. Whose stuff does this belong to? And of course, Judah can get get belongs to me. Right? Judah's response is this woman has done nothing wrong. She is more righteous than I, more honest than I. She would not be denied. And it wasn't that she had to lie and trick me into doing something I didn't want to do. She forced me to do something I was supposed to have done. I was supposed to love my son's wife. As though she was my daughter. I was supposed to to love their lost children who died to suicide because they are God's children. Not because of something they did or, or, or were unable to confess. This is God's confession. This is my child. This is I was wrong brings her into her home, and she gives birth to two children, right? Zerah, it, 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 that name means rise, shine, shine forth, rise and shine, rise, or shine. That, that's the, and his hand comes out of the womb, comes out of the birthing canal, and the, the, the woman who's there to help give birth puts a, a red string, because they knew that she had twins, put, puts a red string around his wrist. This is the firstborn. And then that hand draws back into the birthing canal, and all of a sudden, another boy pops out. Perez. Breached. Breakthrough. That's what Perez means. Oh, we've had a breach. We've had a, a breakthrough. That, that mother who came and stood in my house, I said, I need a breakthrough. I need a revelation from God to know that my son lives. Because everything I know and have seen and heard in this world says that a good God didn't love my son, and I am worried, and I need a breakthrough. How does one crawl inside of his mother's womb again, after he's been born, in order to be born again? How does that happen? Perez is... In, in, in the lineage of Perez comes King David. In, in the lineage of Perez from King David comes Jesus Christ, the Messiah. The firstborn. See, it's not about your works or your not works. It's not about the have-nots. And it's not about the haves. It's about God who loves you. And, and you can be released from the punishment, from the tears and the anguish the moment you believe it. That God loves you. And, and, and that's that being born again. That, 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 you know, the whole story is, is about love and forgiveness, and how the bride of Christ, how the, this woman lost in widowness, being trying to be kept from, being kept out of, being separated from, the promise. The promise. Promises in Jesus Christ. No, not in the baptism of water. Not in your confession that you chose God to be your Savior. 
comes from God and His Word. And His Word and the integrity behind His Word. Christ doesn't come to kill anyone or to destroy or to condemn. Chapter 8, Gospel of John. Jesus is out at the temple and he's writing something on the ground in the dirt. It's the only thing Jesus is known to write. None of his disciples or himself wrote the Bible. I don't know where the Bible came from other than the Holy Spirit moved people to write about it. Their experience. And this is what they experienced when, when Jesus walked among them, when, when they could hear him, feel him, and touch him. He's writing on the ground, and nobody knows what he wrote. But in my heart and mind, I believe he wrote this. Mina, Mina, Tekel, Parsons. Kingdom is divided. Your time has come to an end. Right? God has seen all. These men find this woman... Caught in adultery, prostituting. They go down to the whorehouse, the Sadducees, the, the, the lawyers, and the Pharisees. And they drag this woman out of the whorehouse. We caught this woman in adultery. Now judge her. Throws her to the feet of Jesus. Now judge her. Because our law says she needs to be stoned to death. Judge her. Prove to us you are righteous. Jesus says, You're right. Your law says you must stone her to death. Now you who have the no sin, throw the first stone. Sometimes these stones are words from our mouths. Sometimes these stones that are coming from our mouths are preventing us to believe our children, those loved ones, people lost to suicide, are, aren't saved. Because of the, uh, the great tragedy and sorrow we feel within our heart. It almost overcomes us to the point we can't believe a good God could love my son. It's hard. But that pain and anguish is the reflection of what God feels when you don't believe he loves that son unconditionally. That's why we carry this cord. God chose you unconditionally. Chose you. The cord is weaving and woven all through it. That's God in you. Weaving and woven throughout you. It says to the crowd, throw the first stone, you who have no sin. And all the people and all the men of the group, from the eldest first, began throwing, dropping down their stones. And, and they walked away and went their own way. And all that's left is Jesus and the adulterous woman. And, and a lot of people want to believe or claim or make you believe that the bride of Christ, that the Christian, that, that you are living in adultery, being unfaithful to God, unfaithful, unfaithful to the law, faithful to your child. Says to the Woman, where 
are your accusers? It's God talking to an adulterous woman. Woman, where are your accusers? Just like a woman or a mother or a father who has lost a loved one and then is allowing their actions to accuse them of being taken away from God's love and grace. And yet, where's our accuser? So that's the thing with Jesus. It's on his return and his second coming. It is about forgiveness, love, mercy, grace. He's coming to deliver to those who are waiting for him to give to them that gift of salvation. To manifest his promise into a reality. With one word, the devil and all his works will vanish. With one word, the Antichrist, and, and that one, that one who claims to have no sin, the devil, will vanish. Will vanish. And, and Jesus says to, to mom, to dad, to us, to a friend, to a brother, to all of us who have lost a loved one to suicide, where, where is the accusers? Who's accusing my son of not being worthy of my love and kingdom? Where is your accusers? It's not there. It's no accusers. And neither shall I accuse you of wrongdoing, bad behavior. Living in prostitution. Being unfaithful to the God whom you say you love. Everything you love, Jesus loves. You love them because Jesus is in you and with you. Where are your accusers? I don't see none. Standing in the presence of the living God. I don't see your accusers. Stand up. You are forgiven. Go in peace. God loves you, cherishes you. It's not going to destroy something you love. Same way. Jesus Christ is the firstborn of the dead. In Christ Jesus, we live and move and have our being. In us, Christ Jesus lives and moves and has our being, has his being. One mind, one body in the body of Christ. Redeemer, comforter, deliverer, giver of mercy. Show your child mercy. Show these suicide victims mercy and God will show you mercy. Wiping away all your tears, releasing you from the sadness, so that you're able to celebrate life with Jesus. Where does the fear come from? The punishment? Where does the punish come from? My unbelief. My unbelief that a good God could love and cherish my son, my friend, my brother, in the same way I do.
See, God answers prayers. He answers the faithful prayers of a loving mother who cherishes her son, even when they have lost all hope in the dark world. Says hope cannot be found. Same way Jesus holds that son, that suicide victim, in his arms. That child who was lost without hope, in his arms, holding him, hugging him, and cherishing him in the same way mom and dad do. He says, Where are your accusers? Spanished. It's love. There's no greater love, highest form of love, than a friend who laid down his life for his family and friends. And the good news is, Jesus has done it. He did it. He did it first. And we are his friend. And because we know our Father's will, and our Father's will is that none would perish, we believe in our God. He is good. He is love. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, who lives in us, we pray. Father, because you are our shepherd, we shall not want. Father, because you are with me, I will walk through the valleys of the shadows of death. Yet I will fear no evil. Father, I know no weapon formed against me will stand. And in fact, you are going to lay out for me a table of feasting in the presence of my enemies. Remind me that the wolf lies with the lamb. And neither fear one another. Remind me, Father, that your intentions are to lead me to still quiet waters in remembrance of the green pastures in which we're all going to lie. Surely, surely, I will live in the house of God forever. Your house is a house of prayer, hope, mercy, and salvation. In you, I trust. In you, I believe. Thank you. And, amen. <laughs> amen. See, when you come to Jesus, you got to give him everything. The death of my child, the actions that took his hope, I got to give him my everything. Even my inability to be faithful, I got to give it to him. I got to give God everything. And I got to surrender to Jesus Christ and his will. His will. This is the will of God that you would believe. There's nothing that can accuse you to God that you are not God's. Nothing can deliver you out of the hand of God. You are chosen and cherished by God. The evidence is seen in your love for a child who had no hope. 
God is with you. God is with you. God is with you. See you next time.